Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. I knew I was going to do that in Nashville this afternoon. I just feel like saying, wow, that beautiful music that you all put on for us. The uh, two songs that were sung, I think, happen to be two of my very favorite ones and have a lot to do with the sermon today as well. You have a very outstanding choir, and I hope all of you appreciate the hours and hours that go into a fine choir like that. I always thought that Nashville's choir was one of the best, and I have to go back and tell them we have an equal out here. I don't want to say better because it'll get back to Nashville. <laughs> and I live in Nashville. <laughs> I'm a substitute for Mr. Kirk. You know what a substitute is, don't you? That's a replacement. One other time I was speaking and I was a substitute and I told the people there that a substitute is just like a window that breaks and you put a cardboard replacement in there for the time being. It's not as good as a glass piece, but it's just a cardboard replacement. I guess I must have given a fairly good sermon that day. Then a lady came up afterwards and said, Mr. Shields, she says, you're no cardboard substitute. You're a real pain. So uh, <laughs> I hope you can make out through my laryngitis. <laughs> anyway, some of you may know uh, Dick and Paula Burris from years ago. How many of you would know them? I'm just, I'm just curious. Uh, Paula is my sister. And I'm up here to visit with her. She came back from the Philippines here recently. She is not in the church, as you know. And uh, I'm very sad to, about that, but she's doing fine, and that's why I'm up here, to, to visit my sister, whom I haven't seen since 1975. So um, I'm sure she would like to extend her greetings to all of you. She's well. She has three grown kids. Uh, her daughters are over my height, 17 years old. Amy is uh, six. I don't know, I said she's 5'8 or 5'9, and uh, they're all very, very well. Well, would you turn with me now to Revelation 21? Well, I'm a Californian myself, and I found it amusing being in Nashville. The first two weeks, everybody thought I was so happy because I always had a big smile on my face, and really I was... How how many of you are Southerners? I better find out before I... Let's move on. (laughs) I don't want to offend anybody. But really, the accent, I guess, uh, you hear different things in what they're saying. Like someone came up and said, Mr. Shields, he says, I'm Bale. And uh, Bill, you know, I'm Bale. And I said, that's really unfortunate to have a name like that in God's church. He said, what's wrong with Bale? So, uh, so I explained to him. Uh, and then later on, another fellow came These are all things that happened. Another fellow came up and said, my name's Richard. And I said, uh, we're all wretched. And uh, he said, Mr. Shields, I mean like Richard Burton. I said, oh, okay. So it went on and on. I, I, some of them were things I wouldn't say publicly, but, but my, hear, my, my hearing heard certain things, and they were really funny to me. But I'm getting used to it now. I'm sorry if I offend any Southerners here. Revelation 21. Let's get on with the sermon. We know, brethren, that we're preparing for a new heaven and a new earth, a new millennial reign of Jesus Christ, a new order of things. In Revelation 21, the first four verses, you can just skim down through there, and you can see how all things are being made new when Jesus Christ is here on earth, God the Father himself comes down. Notice in verse 5 now of Revelation 21. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. All things new. And later on, in verse 7, He who overcomes shall inherit all things. If we overcome, we're going to inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's if we overcome. And my question today is, do we realize that all things being made new begins with you and me, and began with Jesus Christ, but now with Jesus Christ living in you and me. Are you really becoming new? Are you really becoming new? Are you really changing? Are you and I becoming something that we never, ever have been before? As new as new can be. Not a rehash of the old. Not a remake of the old. But something that has never been before. That's what new means. I think sometimes we think we are to be overhauled, that we are to be 
changed in that way. But God does not overhaul, brethren. God makes new. And I'm asking you and I'm asking myself today, are you and I becoming new? Let's go out of Matthew chapter 18. That's just another way of saying, frankly, are you and I really converting? Are you and I really becoming deeply converted? Or are we putting on a front and a mask? And it is so easy to do. It is so easy to do for any one of us. It's easy to do for if you're a child or if you're a teenager. You learn what looks good and what the right answers are and not really be changing what we are. In Matthew chapter 18, breaking into the context of Jesus talking about a little child, notice in verse 3, Matthew 18, he says, I assuredly, I say to you, I'm reading from the New King James all day today, unless you are converted, unless you are converted, and unless you become like little children, something you have not been spiritually, unless you become something new, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so I think this matter of really becoming new, really changing what we are, instead of just changing the outward form and appearance. And I think I've looked at my life a lot in the last year or so, and I think that I have been guilty of that, of looking very good on the outside. And you know, brethren, all of us can be guilty of that. And and we have to come to that point where we realize it's not how we look, but what we are inside, what we really are. And that's what I want to talk about today. Not a new topic, but I hope to bring some things that might get you thinking on a new light. You know, brethren, you have the redwoods around here. You're not even that far from the Sequoia National Forest. And when you go through that part of the forest, you'll see signs that say, Beware of falling trees. And you look up there and you look at these huge trees. And you say, How could they ever fall down? They're giants. You begin to realize they have no root system. They have very shallow roots. Redwoods have very shallow roots. And you and I can be like that. We can be giants here in church. You and I can be ministers and deacons and song leaders and long-time members, as my sister and my brother-in-law were. Dick Burris was a deacon here giving sermons. He's no longer a member of God's church. We can look good and not really be that good. When we counsel with people uh, as, as minister of God, so many times people will essentially make the statement, well, Mr. Shields, that's just the way I am. You're asking me to do to be something I am not. That's just the way I am. I can't change that. We're not talking about the size of their nose or their height or their, or anything like that. But we're talking about a character change and they say that's just the way I am. And do you and I have that attitude sometimes? Because that attitude basically says, I don't want to be converted. You have to accept me the way I am. Brethren, that will not do. We have to change and make some real changes. Let's go to Luke chapter 13. I want you to look at an aspect of changing and repentance, maybe that we haven't uh, lately. I don't know what your sermons have been here lately, but I, whenever I've talked about this in other places, people have come up and mentioned that there was a new light on an old subject. Because changing what we are is what the foundation of real greatness is. On the flight up here yesterday, I sat beside a gentleman who looked fairly distinguished, and I just got into a casual conversation with him, and before long found out that he was a multimillionaire. And he and I had quite a conversation, and he mentioned, you know, a lot of people think that making a lot of money has to do with a lot of skills you have. It really doesn't. It has to do with basic character, was a statement that he made. And when I learned that, I began to make a lot of money. When I began to make sure there were no flaws in my conduct, it was a very interesting conversation with a man who is a multimillionaire, a man who recently had an audience with the Pope and, and making contracts with the Soviet Union and doing great things, in a sense, for this world. And he made that statement, and how true it really is. In Luke chapter 13, I'm going to go through a lot of these verses fairly quickly, the, the ones that we use commonly in the church, uh, because we do know them. But here's the story where the Galileans had been killed, uh, Pilate had mingled their blood with their sacrifices, And Jesus said to those around him in verse 2, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent. And that's the foundation of change. That's the foundation of becoming new. You will all likewise perish. Well, the ones who were killed when that tower in Siloam fell down, he says, Are they any worse? I tell you, no, verse 5. But unless you repent, you will also likewise perish. So I think we need to 
come to understand that this matter of becoming new starts with the death of the self. And I'm going to explain that death of self and a new self as we go through this sermon. Because a lot of us are trying to change what we do without changing what we are. You will never, ever make permanent changes. I will never make permanent changes as long as we try to just change what we do without changing what we are. And that's the essence of real repentance. We have to let the self die. We have to repent. Otherwise, we will all be just like these people who are as good as dead on whom the Tower of Siloam fell. Some time ago, I was having a struggle with a particular problem, sin, weakness in my life. And I got a jar of ashes. I just took it out of our wood stove there in Tennessee. I put it in that jar, about a half a jar full. I figured I, that would be about what I would be if I, was, if I would be burned up. In the lake of fire, if I didn't change, if I didn't overcome, if I didn't really repent, I'd be about a half a jar full of ashes. And I put my name on that jar with masking tape. Me is all it said. Now that might sound a little strange to you, but it worked. I put it on my desk for about a week. When I'd pray, I'd look at that jar and say, God, that's me if I don't change me, if you don't change me, if I don't become really something different than what I have been. Not just look good. Not to sound good, but really change. That's me. Some of you will hear a taller. You might have a, a full jar of ashes. But it's not worth an awful lot more. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is changing what we really are. And it starts with understanding repentance. So let's go back on this old subject, first of all, of repentance. We know the Protestants always have these altar calls where it's all emotion. Sometimes we make fun of the emotional part of repentance, and yet the Bible does say that true repentance is a tearing, a rending of the heart. We know the passage. If you want to write it down, I won't turn to these. We know these passages in Joel 2, Joel 2, verses 12 and 13. Feelings are involved where God says in Joel 2, verses 12 and 13, rend your heart and not just your garments. When we come to see the self, has there been really, brethren, deep down, a rending of the heart where we come and cry for mercy, not justice, but cry for mercy at God's throne and we come to see ourselves? You know, in Peter's day, when on the day of Pentecost, when he preached that sermon about how they had killed the Christ, it says... And they were pricked in their hearts. They were deeply moved in their hearts. Something hurt. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. Repent and be converted. And that's what my topic is today. Repent and really change. Don't just say you're sorry, but really prove it by some real change. Now, an emotional person, I think, will show it more than an unemotional person will. I think that is typical. So if you're an unemotional person, don't feel that you necessarily haven't repented. If you haven't had a lot of crying or something like that, an emotional person will have more. But let me also now go on to say that being sorry, this is something I'm coming to see more and more, and something that I hope all of us come to see more and more. Being sorry is not the same as being repentant. Being sorry is not the same as being repentant. When you're repentant, you are sorry, but it goes further than that. Being repentant means that new, godly actions follow that repentance. That new, godly actions follow that true repentance. We will still slip up, but our way of life is changing. That's all you know already. I'm just covering this quickly to come to my main point. We may not ever be totally perfect, but a way of life changes. We no longer continually lie. We no longer continually look at pornography. We no longer regularly steal and cheat on our income tax and rob God of his tithe. The way of life changes or there's no real repentance or there's no real conversion. David was converted, but he still had some slip-ups. But he did not have those as a regular way of life. We read of Bathsheba. 
But we don't read of Rachel and Jane and Isabel and all the others. You know what I'm saying? He had some slip-ups. He had some new slip-ups after that. He numbered Israel, glorifying himself. He did other things wrong. He lied at times. But you don't find that those sins happen again and again and again as a way of life. So conversion is a process. Let me explain that. I don't want to be discouraged by the sermon, but rather encouraged by the time we're done. It's a long process. But it has to be a process. There has to be movement. There has to be growth. There has to be newness that you and I can look back to. Or else we won't be in God's kingdom. And God sincerely wants us to be in God's kingdom. So if we're still routinely breaking the Sabbath, using God's name in vain, and I hear in God's church, more and more, God's people saying Jesus or Christ or taking God's name itself directly and not to mention even the euphemisms. If we still regularly abuse our wife and don't treat her with respect and honor her, honoring her and coming to know her, if you wives don't respect your husband still, you know, these are areas that are us, the real us, that have to change. I remember talking one time with a person who made the comment, well, Mr. Shields, I've changed all these other areas and, and this area you're working with me on. Aren't I allowed one little sin? Do we have that attitude sometimes? Well, I've quit Christmas and I don't eat pork anymore, you know, the real big things. And uh, I've learned not to say gosh anymore. And I'm home more often. Come on, allow me this one little thing. What I told that person, I said, Goliath was once a, once a little tiny little thing. Probably a cute little baby. But that problem, that little problem baby whom God said to kill, God said to kill all the Philistines, all the Canaanites. That little baby they did not kill grew up to be a giant problem. And these little sins in our lives that start off little if we don't put them down and get rid of them and really put them down and repent and do works befitting repentance, grow up like Goliath to become a giant problem in our lives and take over. And so, no, we cannot say that we've repented unless we have repented of every area of our life. When a person has deeply repented, you know what? If you have deeply repented, your marriage is going to show it. If you have deeply repented, your finances are going to show it. If you have deeply repented, your child rearing is going to show it. If you have deeply repented, the way you treat everybody from a baby on up is going to show it. But we think that we've repented because we're here on Saturday instead of Sunday. Because we don't any longer keep a Christmas tree in the house in December. But we go on sometimes, I've done it, you've done it, we go on sometimes living a life that is not a new life. And there's been no real deep repentance, unless it shows in our child rearing, in our marriage, in our finances, in our language, in the way we work, in the way we talk, in the way we walk, in the way we dress, in the way we eat, that everything we do brings glory to God. There are no exceptions. We're not allowing the little Goliaths to live in our lives. There are no baby Goliaths that we're allowing to live. Then we know we're repenting of what we are. The commitment to total change. It's not just accepting a bunch of new doctrines. You know, there are a lot of people in God's church, and I suspect right here in San Jose, because I found it everywhere who think they are God's people because now they keep a Saturday Sabbath and they keep, they go to the feast. They don't believe they're going to heaven and they hope they're not going to hell. And they've accepted a new set of teachings, doctrines. But we have not accepted, some of us, a new way of life. I mean to speak to your heart today. I hope I am. I hope I'm causing your heart to be pricked. If so, maybe we'll come to see the need to really convert very, very deeply and to repent very, very deeply. What do we repent of? I'm going to talk about two main areas to repent of. 
The first main area is real simple, sin. You repent of sins, right? Sin is the transgression of God's law. So we repent of anything we have broken in God's law. First John 3, 4. We know that. What else do we, what, what, what else defines sin? Can any of you others give me a scripture that says sin is, or this is sin? We know 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the breaking of God's law, transgression of God's commandments. So we break God's law, we repent of that. But what else, when we say we repent of sins, what else defines sin in God's word? Blah, blah, blah is sin. Can any of you think of one? Go ahead, raise your hand on this one. I'd like to, I'd like to get us thinking on this one. Yes, sir. Whatever is not of faith is sin. So whenever we see that we have broken our conscience, when we have done something where we really didn't feel right about it, we went ahead and did it, we have to repent of those things because those also are sins. God wants us to have a tender conscience. Can you think of another one? When we say sin, yes, ma'am. Excellent. James 4, verse 17. You see, James 4, 17 defines sin of omission. The times we should have done something and we did not. I don't think we often repent of those things. We think of the things we did that we shouldn't have done. That's the sins of commission. 1 John 3, 4, breaking God's law. But how about the times we should have called that person we knew was discouraged and we didn't? And we found out later on they were really down and all they needed was a phone call. Just you calling up and saying, I just want to call and tell you I love you. Would have brought them out of the doldrums. You knew of a widow who really desperately needed help. You lived two blocks away and you didn't go help her. And you should have and you could have. I heard a sermon from Pasadena one time where this man was uh, feeling very guilty because he had heard this sermon about helping the widows and that that was true religion and all of that. And uh, this lady, widow nearby, had mentioned over and over how she needed some help moving a giant rock in her yard. Finally, he felt, well, maybe I better go, go help her. And uh, when she got there, the lady said, oh, it's all fine. My, my next door neighbor said, I saw you struggling with that crowbar and shovel trying to move that huge rock. And uh, boy, I want to help you do that. Then he felt real guilty because someone not in God's church came over and helped the widow move a big rock when he could have and should have done it. Now, that's the sin of omission. He came to see it. James 4, verse 17. That's the verse that was quoted. He who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Sins of omission. So that's sin. We know we're supposed to repent of sin. I've gone over this part very, very quickly because I want to get now into the real deeper essence, I believe, of what repentance is. We don't repent. If you go back over the booklets on repentance and conversion and being a real Christian, we don't repent of just sin, brethren. We repent, we repent of what caused the sin. And you know who that was? You know what that was? The second major thing we repent of is self. Now, you and I have heard that many times. But it's just been the last few years, I think I've really began to focus deeply on that. What does it mean to change, to repent of, to become new in the self? You read the booklet and Mr. Armstrong says in that booklet on repentance that you have to repent of what you are. How many of us in God's church will really understand that? So we have to change what we are. And that's really what I'm getting at in the rest of my sermon. When I counsel someone for baptism, I will typically ask a question like this. I'd like you to honestly ask yourself how, at the time you were baptized, you would have answered this question. I want to know if they've really come to repentance. And so I ask them, Mrs. So-and-so, are you a gossip? Now, here's the minister in your living room or in his office asking you point blank, are you a gossip? How would you have answered that when you were baptized? The usual response I get goes like this. Well, uh, no. everybody gossips. Uh, Mrs. So-and-so, I'm not asking about everybody. I'm asking you about you. Are you a gossip? 
Oh, no, not really. Uh, no. Have you ever gossiped? Well, everyone's gossiped once or twice. But it's not like I'm out there gossiping all the time. Oh, so you've gossiped sometimes. Twice? I don't know. Maybe 20 times? 50 times? I don't know. 100 times? It's not like I'm out there all the time. So, okay, let's go back to the original question. Are you a gossip? No. No, I, I'm not a gossip. Now, I could use worse things by the human standards, but I pick on gossiping. Finally, when they say no, very, very few have ever said yes. Very few have said yes to feels I am a gossip. I mean, that hurts. To look the minister in the eye, I am a gossip. How do I know he's not? He's not going to go around telling everybody I'm a gossip. You know? Right? I mean, you've got to protect the self here a little bit. Like those four ministers I heard about who got together, and you know, Catholic and a rabbi, and you've heard this one, the priest, and... Uh, uh, who would be the other one? Another Protestant minister. And the, the rabbi said, well, hey, listen, let's all, we, we know each other pretty well. Let, let's, let's finally confide to each other uh, what our sins are and what our secret sins are that our parish don't know about. And so the Catholic priest said, well, okay, I'll start. Uh, um, weekends, Saturday, Friday night, I get dressed in civs to these, and I go out there into a different town, and I date all the women, and well, it's not very pretty scene, you know. But they don't know about it. No one's being hurt. So then the uh, the uh, Baptist minister says, "Well, that's true. I mean, I preach hellfire and brimstone against drinking. But Friday night, I tell you, I I get drunk every Friday night." And then uh, the next one says, "Well, you know, I uh, cheat on my income tax. I I really am terrible about that." And finally, the fourth one's just sitting there saying nothing. And they say, well, brother, what's, what's your problem? He says, well, I'm a gossip. <laughs> and I can hardly wait <laughs> to get going. <laughs> All right? So, are you a gossip? Now, this person will usually say no because it hurts to bear the self Rip open the heart and say, this is me. I. That's the proper grammar. This is I. Me sounds better. This is me. You know? This is the real me. So then I say, okay, but you have admitted to gossip thing 50 times. I say, how would we feel if Ted Bundy, the, the man electrocuted uh, in the Florida electric chair here a couple months ago. Remember Ted Bundy? All of you? Okay. And he had been, he had admitted to many, many murders, sadistic murders. How do we feel if Ted Bundy says, hey, look, I've killed 50 people. Don't call me a murderer. It's not like I'm out there every day. Huh? I mean, a lot of people have done that. I don't do it every day. Okay, I flipped up. Now, are you getting the point? It hurts to say I am a liar. It doesn't hurt so much to say, God forgive me because I lied. Or I said a lie. Because in saying it that way, we can take the sin and we can put it over there, kind of step away from that horrible thing over there and say, forgive that horrible thing I did over here. See? But when you bring the thing you did and say, I did it because that's what I am, a liar. Boy, that hurts. That humbles you. And now you're beginning to repent of what you are. You see, when you lie, it's because you are a liar. When I commit adultery, or you commit fornication, or you and I break God's Sabbath, or whatever it is, because that's what we are. If you scrimp on your tithes, or don't pay a couple of them, or you lie on your income tax, don't report something the government would say you should report, that is because you are a thief.
Let that sink in. That's what you are. That's what I am when I do that. When I go and I say, well, you know, man, oh, man, I've been catching up with some of my old classmates. <laughs> the story, man, oh, man. This one, she married a woman who changed herself into a guy. Man, <laughs> when I'm doing that, it's because I am not full of God's love. And I'm a gossip. You come to see that. You don't repent of what you said. You repent of what you are. Because what you are caused you to do what you did. Then you have the essence of real change. How many times does a murderer have to murder before we say he's a murderer? Show me on, on your hands. How many, how many times does he have to murder? One time. But somehow when we get to the so-called lesser sins, you, can, I, you and I can gossip a thousand times. As long as we're not doing it continually, we're not a gossip. And that's self-deception. Let's go to John chapter 8. Now, if you and I are going to change what we are, we have to first come and see what we are. When we do these things. Any of you who are not yet baptized, who are coming to baptism, have to come to see this. Or else there's no real repentance. No real deep repentance. Not a total repentance. Those of you who have been, re who have repented and are baptized and didn't see this before, I'm not saying your baptism's invalid. I'm simply saying come to see this aspect of it and repent of this aspect. I believe repentance and conversion and the understanding of it is like any other subject, we grow in it. I look back at my uh, repentance and my conversion 17 years ago, and I say, wow, I don't think I knew very much about it back then. I've heard Mr. Partian say that in sermon. You grow in understanding. Let's grow in understanding of what we are. John 8, what we have been. I hope we're no longer many of these things. I hope we really are genuinely changing with God's nature in us. John 8, 44, Jesus said to the Jews, following him, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and doesn't stand in the truth. John 8, 44, because there's no truth in him. How can he tell the truth when he's not a truthful being? When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. Why does he lie? The end of verse 44, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, you see, God cannot lie because it's not his nature any more than a mouse can crow because it's not in the mouse's nature to crow. Cannot do it. You and I can and we do these things because it is our nature. And that's what the, the very basic essence of what I'm trying to get at. Now, is there any good in the self before God's Spirit comes into you? Now, hear me carefully, the way I'm wording it. Is there any good in the self before God's Spirit really comes into you? You know, brethren, God says, uh, God inspires in uh, Romans 7, let's go over there and read this, that if we come to repentance, we have to come to see this. If we're going to really change, we have to see that uh, God has to give us a completely whole new being. God will preserve a certain amount of the personality, our characters, I mean our character traits, our personality in that sense, but as far as goodness in the carnal self, uh, you're going to find, brethren, that God does not want to save an awful lot of that, if any. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Now, this is an apostle who has been an apostle for many years saying this. He didn't say, I was carnal. He said, as long as I'm in the flesh, I still have within me this other nature pulling me down. Uh, he told the Corinthian people, you have these problems for you are yet carnal. And now here he's saying that he is still sometimes very carnal, that he has this carnality still within his members. You have to understand that. I am carnal, sold under sin. Now in verse 18. I know that in me, now he qualifies it, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Now in him also was God's spirit, 
And God's Spirit is good. God's Spirit is God's nature. And that's why he qualifies it in verse 18. I know that in me, that is in my flesh. Nothing good dwells. And yet later on, Paul says, look, I was thought at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the law, blameless. You want to be strict? I was a Pharisee. And yet he says, all of that was tainted by my carnality, and I considered all but done, he says later on in Philippians, or earlier on. Uh, I don't remember now when was, which one was written when, but uh, at another time he said that. For I know that in me nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what's good I don't find. Yet when we counsel people for baptism, and even people who've been baptized, they will make a lot of times statements like, I've not been like everyone else, Mr. Fields. I usually say, I thank thee, Lord, that I'm not as this publican. <laughs> and they usually get the point. Or like even this millionaire on the plane I was sitting beside. He says, Philip, he says, I have no character flaw. I smiled. I thought to myself, it's nice to meet God. <laughs> Who knows, maybe I'll meet him again. No character flaw. A little proud, maybe, but no character flaw. So many of us were like that when we first visited the minister. Maybe you were. Maybe you weren't. I don't know. We have to come to see that, as Jeremiah says, the heart, what I am inside, is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Deceitful above all things. Now, that means my heart. That means your heart. That means it's so deceitful it can fool us. And we need to go to God and say, like David, I want a new heart. I want a clean heart, a new spirit. Renew a new spirit within me. Now, once we come to really see the self... Why do we defend it? You ever find yourself defending the self? You know, when you and I get offended because of an accusation that may or may not be true, and usually it is true, or at least partially true, it's because we are taking that old corpse that was the old self that we buried at baptism, and we pull it out of the ground and we dress it up in a tuxedo, put makeup on it, and say, what a lovely corpse. Doesn't he look good? I mean, have you ever been to funerals? And the people look at this cadaver in the coffin, and they say, doesn't he look nice? Then they do a good job on him. He looks so natural, but he's dead. <laughs> right? Now, I was counseling with a man one time who had committed multiple fornication, adultery, and even once he knew, I knew... He began to justify it. I finally said, you know what you're doing? You're putting a tuxedo on a corpse. It's still a corpse. I said, I'm not here to roast you. I'm here, I'm here to help you. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to love you. I'm not here to put you out of God's church. I'm here to help you into God's kingdom. But don't defend the cadaver, the old self. Let it die. Let it go. Let it be buried. That's what I've done. You've done that. How do we defend the cadaver? We start to blame other people. When you're really trying to see the self and get rid of the self and become new, you don't blame other people. You take full responsibility for your actions. But what do we say? We say, she made me mad. She made me mad. That's why I said what I said after this. She made me, she made me mad. I said, what did she do to make you mad? Did she turn a switch that was beyond your control? No, you let yourself get mad. She didn't make you mad. Don't blame her. For he seduced me. He what? Where was your role in this? Did he put a gun to your head and say, take your clothes off, we're going to bed? Well, no, Mr. Shield. 
Oh, so you did it. You see, you take responsibility for your sins. And that hurts. But when you say, yes, we were both at fault and I gave in, Mr. Shields, I shouldn't have been in that situation. I let myself get down. I wasn't praying like I should have been, so I was weak. And I did it. And I am sorry. And there's nothing to defend. I was wrong. And I want to change. I want to be new. We're getting someplace. We will blame, ah, I'm, I'm terrific at that. Most husbands are blaming their wife. If they're late, it's their wife's fault. Uh, she wasn't watching the map carefully enough. Uh, uh, she didn't put the cat out, and we had to go back and put the cat out. Uh, it's always the wife's fault. Or am I the only husband like that? I'm trying to overcome that. Or it's somebody else's fault. Or we might even say the alarm didn't go off. Have you ever thought about that? The alarm didn't go off. I said, well, if you have a, a clock, I said to people, if you have a clock that doesn't work, throw it away. <laughs> Why didn't the alarm go off? Do you have a clock that doesn't... Well, Mr. Shields, I put it on p.m. instead of a.m., so it went off at 7 p.m. instead of 7 a.m. Oh, you made a mistake. Or they'll say, Mr. Shields, I didn't... Uh, this is a teenager I'm talking to in my mind here who was saying this. He was late for... Uh, I didn't turn it on. Oh, the clock was fine. You didn't turn it on. I said, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I do the same thing. I make stupid mistakes. But learn to take responsibility. Or my mother didn't get me up on time. Right? We had a question in table topics about the, whether we should have credit cards. Oh, I cut up my credit cards. Because, boy, they just get me in debt. You see the deceitfulness of the self? So I said to the man, I said, what did your credit card do? Did it walk out of your wallet? <laughs> hey, I want one of those. Cash or visa, you know. Back into the wallet. Credit card, come here. You see, my credit card's always getting me in trouble. Start hearing yourself. Start hearing yourself. And you'll find that we defend the old cadaver so beautifully. Where did my shoes go? <laughs> oh, we, we laugh. I laugh at this too, but... I wrote these examples down when I finally, very heartbrokenly, came to me playing my wife, my kids, my dog. The traffic. Finally, I say, God, you can have it. And God looks at you and God looks at me and says, you know, it's dead. You know what we do with dead bodies? We bury them. Sometimes we want to keep a part of our old dead self, like that little Goliath, like I mentioned. You know why we, when we baptize you, we, we baptize all of you? Like this man I was counseling one time for baptism, he said, Mr. Seals, do I really have to give that part up? I mean, is it really that bad? I said, yes, it'll kill you. It'll kill you. He said, but I don't know if I'm quite ready to give that part of me up. He said, I'll tell you what. When we baptize you, we'll let you stick your arm up above the water to represent the part of you that you feel you want to hang on to. You start to get the point. See, when we baptize you, we put the whole cadaver under, all of it. There's nothing worth salvaging there. We immerse the whole body. Uh, there's nothing that's pure about us in the flesh that's worth salvaging. Human nature cannot be righteous in God's way by itself. Now let's go to Luke 18 look at the scriptures that illustrate the, the point of what I'm trying to say. And believe you me, brethren, when you come to repent this way, you're going to have a deeper emotion and a deeper feeling, and you're going to uh, come to see yourself in a way that maybe you haven't before. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. I've heard ministers say, where did that verse go? <laughs> they turn to the wrong verse. They say, it was here this morning. <laughs> Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. 
Also, he spoke this parable to those who trusted in themselves. That's a fatal, fatal response to trust in yourself. And they, that they were righteous. Now, when you trust yourself that you are righteous, you're going to come to the next part of verse 9 as a natural consequence. You're going to despise others. And you haven't come to see yourself. You're going to despise others. And you know the story. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He was a self-made man worshiping his creator. And he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I thank you that I'm not like my neighbor, that I'm not like this other guy, that I'm not like Mr. So-and-so. Well, I hope you see yourself here if you have. I fast twice a week. They fasted every Tuesdays and Thursdays. You could tell who the Pharisees were. They were the skinny ones. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. Now he says something that I hope you and I will begin to understand here. I used to think that I needed to repent of every possible sin I've ever committed. And I tried many times to think, is there anything else that I, that I can go back and think of and present to God? And later on I began to realize that's the wrong approach. When you repent for what you are, that automatically covers everything that what you are did. And that's what he, what's what he says here. He says he beat upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. That's what I am. He didn't ask for justice. He asked for mercy because he saw what he was. Job came to that point when Job said, I am vile. I abhor myself. He didn't try to list all the things he had done wrong. When he had listed his life's record, it was a very impressive list. I was an eye to the blind, a feet to the lame, and etc., etc., etc. But when he came to see himself, he says, I can't stand the self. I abhor myself. So let me put it even stronger yet. There's nothing that can be said about you and me in our carnal nature, in our carnal nature, that could be too strong. Because you and I can do and be about anything apart from God. If you have not come to see that about yourself, you have not come to see yourself. I will stand here as God's minister and tell you I can commit adultery. And I can kill. I've had people who say, Mr. Hughes, I don't think I ever could kill. And I say, then you don't know yourself. You mean if you came home one time and you heard some screaming in, in your home and you rushed in there and there were three men in there and the first body you come to is your little nine-year-old bloodied up, barely moving, and here are these three men beating and attacking and sexually attacking your wife, you could not kill you don't know yourself. I could. And I'd ask God to forgive me later. But they would be dead. Now, I hope I wouldn't. But I could. Someone says, I could never commit adultery. Oh, yes? You're in a concentration camp? And this jack-booted SS trooper comes up to you and says, you sleep with me tonight or we torture your daughter piece by piece in front of your eyes. How long would you last? I hope you would last. I hope you wouldn't commit adultery. But you could. You could. Oh, yes, you could. And so we come to see the potential of the self. We come to see then that repenting of self includes attitudes. Not just what we did, but attitudes, brethren. You've got to repent. Repenting of self includes attitudes. Put that down. You start to go to God and you say, God, I am self-righteous. I justify myself. I am proud. I am lustful. I am discontent. I am unthankful, unholy, ungrateful, vain. I am selfish. Self-centered, spiritually lazy. 
I am a racist. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. So I'm giving a list of things that we should repent of if these are things we are. I am stubborn. I am headstrong and rebellious and hypocritical. I am unforgiving and judgmental. I am a sinner. And I don't want to be those things anymore. We must come to see that our very nature, our very attitude has to change. Now, brethren, let me illustrate it this way. Why does a rooster crow? Why does a rooster crow? And why does a cat not crow? It's a very deep question. Why does a rooster crow? Because it's a rooster's nature. That's what roosters do. That came home to me and I saw the, the movie presentation of, the, of uh, Roots, the movie Roots. And this, this young girl, Kizzy, was that her name? She came up and she says, how come my boyfriend acts this way and he's this way and that way? And, and the smart old uncle says, honey cow, he says, you see that rooster over there? You know the why he crows? Because that's what he is. He's a rooster. And roosters crow. And your boyfriend over here, he's acting that way because that's what boys do. That's what boys be. He's just being true to his nature, child. Being true to his nature. And that's why roosters crow. Because that's what roosters do. Because that's what they are. And a cat meows because it's its nature. Now it would be a miracle to make a cat begin to think and act and be like a rooster. And what you would have to do is somehow miraculously take a rooster nature and put it in the cat's brain. And yet that's what God has done to you and me. He's taken a totally different nature called the Holy Spirit, called His nature, put it into us while we are still carnal. So we have human nature and we have God's nature. It would be like this rooster that still is a rooster but someone put a cat nature in it as well. Now you wonder why you're confused sometimes? Well, be like this rooster that sometimes feels tempted to crow and yet feels tempted to be like a cat sometimes too. That's what God is doing to us. And as we exercise that new nature, it grows inside of us. It gets stronger inside of us. God gives us more of that nature. So finally the old nature, like the rooster nature, would begin to be crowded out. But it takes time, and God understands it. And God understands that that poor rooster is going to crow sometimes, even though he's putting the cat nature, because that, he still has that nature. God will understand that you and I will still flip up. But if we're going to God and being saved day by day, then we are going to be changed to something we've never been before. You know, brethren, Jesus is our Savior. But you know how he saves us? He doesn't save us by his death. The death forgives us. He saves us by his life. And what does that mean? It means that day by day we have to go to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ, save me today. Today, give me your nature. Today, let me follow your thoughts, your ways, your actions. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, God says. So we have to ask him to put those thoughts into our very being. That's why we pray. That's why we study. That's why we seek him. Because there's still that old rooster nature in the analogy. And we want to crowd that out and become something we've never been before. And when that new nature comes into us, we are a new being that's never been before. It's not something you can cause yourself. Some of us think that what God does would be like if you took the uh, coffee grounds and a coffee percolator. Picture that now, okay? And they look dirty and awful, right, when you're done with them? We think God takes out that coffee filter, shakes it out, washes it under tap, and says, now you're cleaned up, this is you. And he reuses that. No, he doesn't. That's not new. God throws that away. He takes out a brand new coffee filter that's never been used before to represent us. Something that's never been before. A whole new creation. Let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter 5, and that's what you and I have to be. That's what you and I have to become. That's what we have to realize God is doing to us. That we don't want to submit any longer to the old self and the old nature. 2 Corinthians 5, we have to start looking at each other this way. Even when we see each other slip, that we have to say, God is forgiven this child. God sees this person in a whole new light. Conversion is a process, and I love this child of God as he or she loves me, and I am becoming new. 
In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 17, the love of Christ constrains us, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 17, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. It's like we all died. He died for us, and he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died. We're now a slave of righteousness. We should no longer present ourselves as instruments to unrighteousness, he says in Romans 6. We become a whole new being, serving a whole new master. And he died for all, brethren. You know, I, I've come to see also something I want to share with you. I think sometimes we, we generalize the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I think you come to see it more fully when you think to yourself this way. And I have come to see this, and I come to believe this very deeply. That if Adam and Eve had never sinned, if they hadn't raised Cain and he'd never sinned, and if Noah and nobody else had ever sinned, the people in Noah's day had never sinned, if Judas Iscariot had never sinned, nobody had ever sinned, and then I was born, and I sinned. And I was the only sinner. In 1989, I finally sinned. No one else has ever sinned. There's no doubt in my mind that Jesus, my Savior, would say, God, I need to go down and die for Philip. Just for him. Because we like to think that he died for all of us. And, well, I'm one of a number. But would he have died just for me? And would he live just for me? We have to make it much more personal. Yes, he would die just for you. He would leave the 99 under care and go find the other one who's lost. Just for you. And he will live just for you as well, if you would let him. It's an entirely new and a beautiful concept when you really let it sink in. Verse 16, therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. Don't look at each other even anymore saying, well, he's just this way or that's the way she is. And, you know, realize the fleshly nature is still there. We are new. We're changing. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him thus. And we're going to be the same way. He's, we're going to become spirit. We're going to be totally different, just like Christ was totally different after he was spirit. And yet, even in the flesh, he committed no sin. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's brand new. Old things have passed away. That's why we don't want to defend the old way. It's a cadaver. That's why some old sins come up and you're asked about them. Don't defend the cadaver. Say, yes, that was me. That was I. I did it. But I have a new life now. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not that way anymore. But yes, the old self was awful, was terrible. But I'm changing. It's going out of Ephesians 4. Or are we changing? Or are we just looking good? I think sometimes we think changing means stopping sin. That's not the idea of changing. That's incomplete. That's not complete enough. Ephesians 4, verses 17 to chapter 5, verse 2, goes through what God means when he says change. You know, brethren, if you no longer just keep Sunday, is that change enough or do you have to do something else? You think about this. Are you really changing? Are you really becoming new? Let's read this now. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 17 to the end of the chapter. This I say, therefore, and testify that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, the unconverted people, in the futility of their mind. It goes on saying how they have their feeling, their past feeling in verse 19. And verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you've heard him, verse 21, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, let's start to concentrate on these verses. Verse 22, put off concerning the former conduct. It's an old way. The old man, the old self, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Something new has to begin to happen to you and me. We become a new creation. And that you put on the new man. You walk in newness of life. You are a new creation. You put on the new man. You become something you've never been before, which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Now he says, what do I mean by this? Therefore, put away lying. That's not enough, though, he says, to no longer be lying. He says, you've got to put on something new. 
Each one speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. To say I'm no longer a liar in God's definition would mean that whenever I speak, my yea is yea and my nay is nay. And everything I say is absolutely right. It is truth because that's what God is. That's the way he is. And with God in me, when I speak, I mean it. There is no more lying. No more deception. Verse 26, be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Verse 28, let him who steals, steal no longer. Now, it's not enough, according to this verse, to say I'm no longer stealing. He says you go and you become something you've never been before. Rather, let him labor. And one reason you and I work, working with his hands what's good, that he may have something to give him who has need. I'm no longer stealing. I've changed so much that rather than taking, I am now a giver. They are now taking from me because I generously give it to them. I have so overcome stealing that now I'm giving extra. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's not enough to clean up our language from saying bathroom words and the F words and uh, body system words and all of this. It's not enough to stop saying those bad things. It's not enough to stop saying God's name in vain. We do something very different. But he says, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers? That now when you speak, if someone knew you before that you'd make a sailor blush, now when they hear you speak, they feel good. They feel edified. They feel like they've heard something gracious and beautiful, inspiring. No gossip. Nothing that makes you feel down and discouraged after you hear it, but something that's beautiful and wonderful. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, verse 30, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is changing what we are, you see, brethren. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. It's not enough to stop there, though. You have to go to verse 32. Now, instead of just having a malicious, evil speaking, anger and bitterness against somebody, he says, now we're kind to one another and we're tender hearted. And when someone has hurt us and hurt us and hurt us, maybe someone's committed adultery against your husband or against your wife, and you are very, very, very upset at this person, but you see, you've seen this person repent and he is so sorry, but you want to take his head off with a chainsaw. Oh, yes, that's how you feel. That's how you'd feel. And you go and you say, Brother, I forgive you. I forgive you the way God does. They are blessed who are forgiven. Here, come over and have supper with us. Because when God forgives, He says, Come over and have supper with me. Let's eat and dine together. You'd be part of my family. That's forgiveness. We say, I forgive, but I don't ever want to see your face around here again. Does God say that? Does God say, I forgive Philip Shields or whatever your name is? Oh, I don't want to see your face around here again. Or does he say, I forgive you? And listen, listen, come sit with me on my throne. Come eat beside me at my table and let me serve you. And let me give you the whole earth and let me give you kingdoms and realms and, and let me give you every good thing. Because to prove I've forgiven you, have this and have this and have this and have this. They are blessed, happy, and blessed in the way we think of blessed who are forgiven. But that's what he's saying. Don't just say, I no longer have evil speaking and clamoring. Forgive as God also forgave you. He doesn't just say forgive. He said forgive in the way God forgave you. That is tough when someone's committed adultery against you. Or someone caused you to be arrested wrongfully. Or someone molested your child. Oh, it's easy to forgive someone who accidentally tripped you up. How about these toughy things? These tough, tough, tough areas. You can forgive those. You are a forgiving person. You are like Christ. 
you are becoming new. And when Jesus talked about forgiveness and becoming new in that way, he said even 70 times 7 you forgive that person. In the account in Luke, the disciples said increase our faith. That's going to take a lot of faith to do that. Jesus says you don't need a lot of faith. All you need is the faith of a mustard seed. Read that in context. That verse is in context of forgiveness. Faith comes by hearing. You hear yourself say, I forgive. And you'll have the faith to do it. Start to be more like me. Start to change what you really are. Not by just trying, but by getting close to Jesus Christ. You can bear no fruit of yourself. But if you abide in the vine, then you shall bear much fruit. I am the vine, and you are the branches. And he who abides in me shall bear much fruit. When someone comes to me and they say, Mr. Shields, I haven't been growing, I haven't been producing fruit, I have to say, then you're not abiding in the vine. Just call every man a liar, but Jesus is true. And he says, if you abide in the vine, you will bear fruit. If I'm not bearing fruit, I'm not abiding, abiding in the vine. I'm not letting him save me day by day. I'm not letting his words come and cleanse me day by day. I'm not letting his mind come into my mind day by day. I'm not letting myself be nude, be made new, be renewed, become something I've never been before day by day by day by day by day. So that's what we're talking about. Now let's go to Matthew 23. Let's understand it very, very deeply, brethren, that changing what we are is what it's all about. Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. Let's understand this passage. Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. And we can be righteous. We get the idea in God's church that you and I could never be righteous. Oh no, we sin every day, we never can be righteous. Never mind the, the verses about righteous lots. And Noah, who was righteous. Oh yes, you and I can be righteous when God is living powerfully within us. Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. We can be new, brethren. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, these little tiny seeds and herbs, and have neglected the weightier matter of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You ought to have done these things without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, and you swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. That is such a powerful verse, brethren, when we deeply understand it. That Jesus Christ is saying, if you want to be something you've never been before, inside is where you work. What you really are. If you have a big bowl of lasagna after someone's come over for dinner, you know what it would look like inside, right? Very, very sloppy. What we do sometimes with our sins, comparing sins that left over lasagna, okay? We take the bowl or the dish and we wash it on the outside. And we hold it up and say, now it looks good and clean, doesn't it? So you tip it over a little bit and see what's inside. Still dirty. God said, for out of the heart proceed lies and adulteries and thefts and angers and murders. Out of the goodness of the heart proceed good things. Out of the evil of the heart proceed evil things. So Jesus here is saying, you want to be new? You want to stop lying? Change inside what you really are, what you really are. So when we take that bowl of lasagna and we stick it in the pan, I mean, we stick it in the basin full of soapy water and we scrub inside, what happens to the outside? It gets cleaner too and the inside is what counts. God looks upon the heart, not upon the outside. What do you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites? You're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This is impression versus character. This is reputation versus character. Reputation is what men think you are, and character is what meant, is what God says you really are. We are here to be new, to be created completely brand, brand new. Let's look at one more verse here in Jeremiah 7. Brethren, let's go to God and say, God, I don't want to be the way I've been. I am a liar. I am a, I am a, a fornicator. 
I am a, an adulterer. I am a gossip. I don't want to be that anymore. I want to change. I want to be brand new. I want to be converted. I don't want to just be changing the exterior things, not eating pork and not keeping Christmas, not just accepting doctrines. I want the self to die, and I want the, the rebirth of Jesus Christ in me. You know, there's a beautiful verse in Galatians where Paul says, I, I labor as a woman in travail for you until Christ is formed in you. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, in Jeremiah 7, verses 8 to 11, these are very telling words about being a doer and about changing what we really are, about not just having certain impressions on the outside. Behold, Jeremiah 7, verse 8, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. All the way to verse 11. Will you steal? Will you murder? Will you commit adultery? Will you swear falsely? Will you uh, burn incense to Baal and walk after other gods whom you don't know? And then come and stand before me in my house, called by my name. Will you come to the worldwide church of God and say we're delivered to do all these abominations? Oh, God will forgive me. Are you not really changing? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I have seen it, says the Lord. He says, don't, don't keep on doing these things, being these things and coming to church and thinking all is okay, you've got to change what you are. You've got to really convert. You've got to have my nature come into your nature. You've got to, like the rooster and the cat analogy, you've got to change to something you've never been before. You've got to become something that you can't do by yourself. That's why you need God's Holy Spirit. So that change has to be total. We become a child of God. And you know, when you see somebody who's a child of somebody, they look... They walk, they talk, they sound like, they are like their father. We had a man in one church area who had a limp because he had a club foot. He had a son who was perfectly normal. And his son, who was five or six at the time, walked with a limp because that's the way dad walked. Until finally dad had to say, son, your feet are okay. You don't need to walk with a limp. But children look like their father. Are you and I looking like father? Are you and I talking like father? Are you and I walking like father? Are we really like father? Which father? Which father? There are two fathers out there. Jesus said to the Jews, you're of your father, the devil. Which father are we looking like and acting like? Which father are we really like? And with Jesus in us, we can have God as our father. We can be made brand new. We can become something we have never been before. I enjoyed being here very much. Thank you for putting up with my laryngitis. This is now January 15, 2005. A good follow-up to this sermon. Our full-fledged, full-length sermon to go in big detail on the new creation. Also have one about now that you've repented, what does God think of you? And I think you'd find that one very encouraging. Also have an in-depth one on forgiving in the same manner that Jesus forgives. Um, some of the topics or some of the points I mentioned in the sermon you just heard with far more detail, far more depth in the newer sermon. But I hope uh, I hope this sermon was helpful to you. And God bless you all. Uh, let's forgive one another when we do this event and allow ourselves to be new and uh, be together in God's kingdom. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Don't get mad. He didn't make you mad. Don't blame her. Well, he seduced me. He what? Where was your role in this? Did he put a gun to your head and say, take your clothes off, we're going to bed? Well, no, Mr. Sheehan. Oh, so you did it. You see, you take responsibility for your sins, and that hurts. But when you say, yes, we were both at fault, and I gave in, 
Mr. Seals, I shouldn't have been in that situation. I let myself get down. I wasn't praying like I should have been, so I was weak. And I did it. And I am sorry. And there's nothing to defend. I was wrong. And I want to change. I want to be new. We're getting someplace. We will blame, I'm, I'm terrific at that. Most husbands are blaming their wife. If they're late, it's their wife's fault. Uh, she wasn't watching the map carefully enough. Uh, uh, she didn't put the cat out and we had to go back and put the cat out. Uh, it's always the wife's fault. Or am I the only husband like that? I'm trying to overcome that. Or it's somebody else's fault. Or we might even say the alarm didn't go off. Have you ever thought about that? The alarm didn't go off. I said, well, if you have a, a clock, I said to people, if you have a clock that doesn't work, throw it away. <laughs> Why didn't the alarm go off? You mean you have a clock that doesn't... Well, Mr. Shields, I put it on p.m. instead of a.m., so it went off at 7 p.m. instead of 7 a.m. Oh, you made a mistake. Or they'll say, Mr. Shields, I didn't... Uh, this is a teenager I'm talking to in my mind here who was saying this. He was late for... Uh, I didn't turn it on. Oh, the clock was fine. You didn't turn it on. I said, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I do the same thing. I make stupid mistakes. But learn to take responsibility. Or my mother didn't get me up on time. Right? We had a question in table topics about the, whether we should have credit cards. Oh, I cut up my credit cards because, boy, they just get me in debt. You see the deceitfulness of the self? Well, I said to the man, I said, what did your credit card do? Did it walk out of your wallet? <laughs> hey, I want one of those. Cash or Visa, you know. Back into the wallet. Credit card, come here. You see, my credit cards always get me in trouble. Start hearing yourself. Start hearing yourself. And you'll find that we defend the old cadaver so beautifully. Where did my shoes go? No, we, we laugh. I laugh at this too, but... I wrote these examples down when I finally, very heartbrokenly, came to me, blaming my wife, my kids, my dog, the traffic. Finally, I say, God, you can have it. And God looks at you and God looks at me and says, you know, it's dead. You know what we do with dead bodies? We bury them. Sometimes we want to keep a part of our old dead self, like that little Goliath, like I mentioned. You know why we, when we baptize you, we, we baptize all of you? Like this man I was counseling one time for baptism, he said, Mr. Seals, do I really have to give that part up? I mean, is it really that bad? He said, yes, it'll kill you. It'll kill you. He says, but I don't know if I'm quite ready to give that part of me up. So I'll tell you what, when we baptize you, we'll let you stick your arm up above the water to represent the part of you that you feel you want to hang on to. You start to get the point. See, when we baptize, we put the whole cadaver under, all of it. There's nothing worth salvaging there. We immerse the whole body. Uh, there's nothing that's pure about us in the flesh that's worth salvaging. Human nature cannot be righteous in God's way by itself. Now let's go to Luke 18 look at the scriptures that illustrate the, the point of what I'm trying to say. And believe you me, brethren, when you come to repent this way, you're going to have a deeper emotion and a deeper feeling, and you're going to uh, come to see yourself in a way that maybe you haven't before. Luke 18, verses 9 to 14. I've heard ministers say, where did that verse go? <laughs> they turn to the wrong verse, they say it was here this morning. <laughs> Luke 18. Verses 9 to 14. Also, he spoke this parable to those who trusted in themselves. That's a fatal, fatal response to trust in yourself. 
and they, that they were righteous. Now, when you trust yourselves that you are righteous, you're going to come to the next part of verse 9 as a natural consequence. You're going to despise others. When you haven't come to see yourself, you're going to despise others. And you know the story. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. He was a self-made man worshiping his creator. And he said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I thank you that I'm not like my neighbor, that I'm not like this other guy, that I'm not like Mrs. So-and-so. Well, I hope you see yourself here if you have. I fast twice a week. They fasted every Tuesdays and Thursdays. You could tell who the Pharisees were. They were the skinny ones. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. Now, he says something that I hope you and I will begin to understand here. I used to think that I needed to repent of every possible sin I've ever committed. And I tried many times to think, is there anything else that I, that I can go back and think of and present to God. And later on I began to realize that's the wrong approach. When you repent for what you are, that automatically covers everything that what you are did. And that's what he, that's what he says here. He says he beat upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. That's what I am. He didn't ask for justice. He asked for mercy because he saw what he was. Job came to that point when Job said, I am vile. I abhor myself. He didn't try to list all the things he had done wrong. When he had listed his life's record, it was a very impressive list. I was an eye to the blind, a feet to the lame, and etc., 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 But when he came to see himself, he says, I can't stand the self. I abhor myself. So let me put it even stronger yet. There's nothing that can be said about you and me in our carnal nature, in our carnal nature, that could be too strong. Because you and I can do and be about anything apart from God. If you have not come to see that about yourself, you have not come to see yourself. I will stand here as God's minister and tell you I can commit adultery. And I can kill. I've had people who say, Mr. Hughes, I don't think I ever could kill. And I say, then you don't know yourself. You mean if you came home one time and you heard some screaming in, in your home and you rushed in there and there were three men in there and... The first body you come to is your little nine-year-old, bloodied up, barely moving. And here are these three men beating and attacking and sexually attacking your wife. You could not kill. You don't know yourself. I could. And I'd ask God to forgive me later. But they would be dead. I hope I wouldn't, but I could. Someone says, I could never commit adultery. Oh, yes? You're in a, you're in a concentration camp? And this jack-booted SS trooper comes up to you and says, you sleep with me tonight, or we torture your daughter, piece by piece, in front of your eyes. How long would you last? I hope you would last. I hope you wouldn't commit adultery. But you could. You could. Oh, yes, you could. And so we come to see the potential of the self. We come to see then that repenting of self includes attitudes. Not just what we did, but attitudes, brethren. You've got to repent. Repenting of self includes attitudes. Put that down. You start to go to God and you say, God, I am self-righteous. I justify myself. I am proud. I am lustful. I am discontent. I am unthankful, unholy, ungrateful, vain. I am selfish, self-centered, spiritually lazy. I am a racist. Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. I'm giving a list of things that we should repent of 
if these are things we are. I am stubborn. I am headstrong and rebellious and hypocritical. I am unforgiving and judgmental. I am a sinner. And I don't want to be those things anymore. We must come to see that our very nature, our very attitude has to change. Now, brethren, let me illustrate it this way. Why does a rooster crow? Why does a rooster crow? And why does a cat not crow? It's a very deep question. Why does a rooster crow? Because it's the rooster's nature. That's what roosters do. That came home to me when I saw the, the movie presentation of, the, of uh, Roots, the movie Roots. And this, this young girl, Kizzy, was that her name? She comes up and she says, how come my boyfriend acts this way and he's this way and that way? And, and the smart old uncle says, honey cow, he says, you see that rooster over there? You know the why he crows? Because that's what he is. He's a rooster. And roosters crow. Your boyfriend over here, he's acting that way because that's what boys do. That's what boys be. He's just being true to his nature, child. Being true to his nature. And that's why roosters crow. Because that's what roosters do. Because that's what they are. And a cat meows because it's its nature. Now it would be a miracle to make a cat begin to think and act and be like a rooster. And what you would have to do is somehow miraculously take a rooster nature and put it in the cat's brain. And yet that's what God has done to you and me. He's taken a totally different nature called the Holy Spirit, called His nature, put it into us while we are still carnal. So we have human nature and we have God's nature. It would be like this rooster that still is a rooster but someone put a cat nature in it as well. Now you wonder why you're confused sometimes? Well, be like this rooster that sometimes feels tempted to crow and yet feels tempted to be like a cat sometimes too. That's what God is doing to us. And as we exercise that new nature, it grows inside of us. It gets stronger inside of us. God gives us more of that nature. So finally the old nature, like the rooster nature, would begin to be crowded out. But it takes time, and God understands it. And God understands that that poor rooster is going to crow sometime, even though he's putting the cat nature, because he still has that nature. God will understand that you and I will still slip up. But if we're going to God and being saved day by day, then we are going to be changed to something we've never been before. You know, brethren, Jesus is our Savior. But you know how he saves us? He doesn't save us by his death. The death forgives us. He saves us by his life. And what does that mean? It means that day by day we have to go to Jesus Christ and say, Jesus Christ, save me today. Today, give me your nature. Today, let me follow your thoughts, your ways, your actions. Your thoughts are not my thoughts, God says. So we have to ask him to put those thoughts into our very being. That's why we pray. That's why we study. That's why we seek him. Because there's still that old rooster nature in the analogy. And we want to crowd that out and become something we've never been before. And when that new nature comes into us, we are a new being that's never been before. It's not something you can cause yourself. Some of us think that what God does would be like if you took the uh, coffee grounds and a coffee percolator. Picture that now, okay? And they look dirty and awful, right, when you're done with them? We think God takes out that coffee filter, shakes it out, washes it under tap, and says, now you're cleaned up, this is you. And he reuses that. No, he doesn't. That's not new. God throws that away. He takes out a brand new coffee filter that's never been used before to represent us. Something that's never been before. A whole new creation. Let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter 5, and that's what you and I have to be. That's what you and I have to become. That's what we have to realize God is doing to us. That we don't want to submit any longer to the old self and the old nature. 2 Corinthians 5, we have to start looking at each other this way. Even when we see each other slip, that we have to say, God is forgiven this child. God sees this person in a whole new light. Conversion is a process, and I love this child of God as he or she loves me. And I am becoming new. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 17, 
The love of Christ constrains us. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 17, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. It's like we all died. He died for us, and he died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died. We're now a slave of righteousness. We should no longer present ourselves as instruments to unrighteousness, he says in Romans 6. We become a whole new being, serving a whole new master. And he died for all, brethren. You know, I, I've come to see also something I want to share with you. I think sometimes we, we generalize the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I think you come to see it more fully when you think to yourself this way. And I have come to see this, and I come to believe this very deeply. That if Adam and Eve had never sinned, if they hadn't raised Cain and he'd never sinned, and if Noah and nobody else had ever sinned, the people in Noah's day never sinned, if Judas Iscariot had never sinned, nobody had ever sinned, and then I was born, and I sinned. And I was the only sinner in 1989. I finally sinned. No one else has ever sinned. There's no doubt in my mind that Jesus, my Savior, would say, God, I need to go down and die for Philip just for him. Because we like to think that he died for all of us, and, well, I'm one of a number. But would he have died just for me? And would he live just for me? We have to make it much more personal. Yes, he would die just for you. He would leave the 99 under care and go find the other one who's lost. Just for you. And he will live just for you as well, if you would let him. It's an entirely new and a beautiful concept when you really let it sink in. Verse 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Don't look at each other even anymore, saying, well, he's just this way, or that's the way she is. And, you know, realize the fleshly nature is still there. We are new. We're changing. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him thus. And we're going to be the same way. He's we're going to become spirit. We're going to be totally different, just like Christ was totally different after he was spirit. And yet, even in the flesh, he committed no sin. Verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's brand new. Old things have passed away. That's why we don't want to defend the old way. It's a cadaver. That's why some old sins come up and you're asked about them. Don't defend the cadaver. Say, yes, that was me. That was I. I did it. But I have a new life now. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not that way anymore. But yes, the old self was awful, was terrible. But I'm changing. Let's go now to Ephesians 4. Or are we changing? Or are we just looking good? I think sometimes we think changing means stopping sin. That's not the idea of changing. That's incomplete. That's not complete enough. Ephesians 4, verses 17 to chapter 5, verse 2, goes through what God means when he says change. You know, brethren, if you no longer just keep Sunday, is that change enough or do you have to do something else? You think about this. Are you really changing? Are you really becoming new? Let's read this now. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 17 to the end of the chapter. This I say, therefore, and testify that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, the unconverted people, in the futility of their minds. It goes on saying how they have their feeling, their past feeling in verse 19. And verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you've heard him, verse 21, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Now, let's start to concentrate on these verses. Verse 22. Put off concerning the former conduct. It's an old way. The old man, the old self, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Something new has to begin to happen to you and me. We become a new creation. And that you put on the new man. You walk in newness of life. You are a new creation. You put on the new man. You become something you've never been before which was created according to God in righteousness and true holiness. Now he says, what do I mean by this? Therefore, put away lying. That's not enough, though, he says, to no longer be lying. He says, you've got to put on something new. Each one speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. 
To say I'm no longer a liar in God's definition would mean that whenever I speak, my yea is yea and my nay is nay. And everything I say is absolutely right. It is truth because that's what God is. That's the way he is. And with God in me, when I speak, I mean it. There is no more lying. No more deception. Verse 26, be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Verse 28, let him who steals, steal no longer. Now, it's not enough, according to this verse, to say I'm no longer stealing. He says you go and you become something you've never been before. Rather, let him labor. And one reason you and I work, working with his hands what's good, that he may have something to give him who has need. I'm no longer stealing. I have changed so much that rather than taking, I am now a giver. They are now taking from me because I generously give it to them. I have so overcome stealing that now I'm giving extra. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's not enough to clean up our language from saying bathroom words and the F words and uh, body system words and all of this. It's not enough to stop saying those bad things. It's not enough to stop saying God's name in vain. We do something very different, but he says, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers? That now when you speak, if someone knew you before that you'd make a sailor blush, now when they hear you speak, they feel good. They feel edified. They feel like they've heard something gracious and beautiful, inspiring. No gossip. Nothing that makes you feel down and discouraged after you hear it but something that's beautiful and wonderful. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God, verse 30, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is changing what we are, you see, brethren. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. It's not enough to stop there, though. You have to go to verse 32. Now, instead of just having a malicious, evil speaking, anger and bitterness against somebody, he says, now we're kind to one another and we're tender hearted and when someone has hurt us and hurt us and hurt us maybe someone's committed adultery against your husband or against your wife and you are very 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 upset at this person but you see you've seen this person repent and he is so sorry but you want to take his head off with a chainsaw oh yes that's how you feel that's how you feel And you go and you say, brother, I forgive you. I forgive you the way God does. They are blessed who are forgiven. Here, come over and have supper with us. Because when God forgives, he says, come over and have supper with me. Let's eat and dine together. You be part of my family. That's forgiveness. We say, I forgive, but I don't ever want to see your face around here again. Does God say that? Does God say, I forgive Philip Shields or whatever your name is? Oh, I don't want to see your face around here again. Or does he say, I forgive you? And listen, listen, come sit with me on my throne. Come eat beside me at my table and let me serve you. And let me give you the whole earth and let me give you kingdoms and realms and and let me give you every good thing. Because to prove I've forgiven you, have this, and have this, and have this, and have this. They are blessed, happy, and blessed in the way we think of blessed, who are forgiven. So that's what he's saying. Don't just say, I no longer have evil speaking and clamoring. Forgive as God also forgave you. He doesn't just say forgive. He said forgive in the way God forgave you. That is tough when someone's committed adultery against you. Or if someone caused you to be arrested wrongfully, or if someone molested your child, oh, it's easy to forgive someone who accidentally tripped you up. How about these toughy things, these tough, tough, tough areas? You can forgive those. You are a forgiving person. You are like Christ. You are becoming new. 
And when Jesus talked about forgiveness and becoming new in that way, he said even 70 times 7 you forgive that person. In the account in Luke, the disciples said increase our faith. That's going to take a lot of faith to do that. Jesus said you don't need a lot of faith. All you need is the faith of a mustard seed. Read that in context. That verse is in context of forgiveness. Faith comes by hearing. You hear yourself say, I forgive. And you'll have the faith to do it. Start to be more like me. Start to change what you really are. Not by just trying, but by getting close to Jesus Christ. You can bear no fruit of yourself. But if you abide in the vine, then you shall bear much fruit. I am the vine, and you are the branches. And he who abides in me shall bear much fruit. When someone comes to me and they say, Mr. Shields, I haven't been growing, I haven't been producing fruit, I have to say, then you're not abiding in the vine. Because call every man a liar, but Jesus is true. And he says, if you abide in the vine, you will bear fruit. If I'm not bearing fruit, I'm not abiding, abiding in the vine. I'm not letting him save me day by day. I'm not letting his words come and cleanse me day by day. I'm not letting his mind come into my mind day by day. I'm not letting myself be nude, be made new, be renewed, become something I've never been before day by day by day by day by day. So that's what we're talking about. Now let's go to Matthew 23. Let's understand it very, very deeply, brethren, that changing what we are is what it's all about. Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. Let's understand this passage. Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. And we can be righteous. We get the idea in God's church that you and I could never be righteous. Oh no, we sin every day, we never can be righteous. Never mind the, the verses about righteous Lot and Noah who was righteous. Oh yes, you and I can be righteous when, when God is living powerfully within us. Matthew 23, verses 23 to 28. We can be new, brethren. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, these little tiny seeds and herbs, and have neglected the weightier matter of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You ought to have done these things without leaving the others undone. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat, and you swallow a camel. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also. That is such a powerful verse, brethren, when we deeply understand it. That Jesus Christ is saying, if you want to be something you've never been before, inside is where you work. What you really are. If you have a big bowl of lasagna after someone's come over for dinner, you know what it would look like inside, right? Very, very sloppy. What we do sometimes with our sins comparing sins that left over lasagna, okay? We take the bowl or the dish and we wash it on the outside. And we hold it up and say, now it looks good and clean, doesn't it? So you tip it over a little bit and see what's inside. Still dirty. God said, for out of the heart proceed lies and adulteries and thefts and angers and murders. Out of the goodness of the heart proceed good things. Out of the evil of the heart proceed evil things. So Jesus here is saying, you want to be new? You want to stop lying? Change inside what you really are, what you really are. So when we take that bowl of lasagna and we stick it in the pan, I mean, we stick it in the basin full of soapy water and we scrub inside, what happens to the outside? It gets cleaner too and the inside is what counts. God looks upon the heart, not upon the outside. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. This is impression versus character. This is reputation versus character. Reputation is what men think you are, and character is what, men, is what God says you really are. We are here to be new, to be created completely brand, brand new. Let's look at one more verse here in Jeremiah 7. Brethren, let's go to God and say, God, I don't want to be the way I've been. I am a liar. I am a, I am a, a fornicator. I am a, an adulterer. I am a gossip. 
I don't want to be that anymore. I want to change. I want to be brand new. I want to be converted. I don't want to just be changing the exterior things, not eating pork and not keeping Christmas, not just accepting doctrines. I want the self to die, and I want the, the rebirth of Jesus Christ in me. You know, there's a beautiful verse in Galatians where Paul says, I, for, I labor as a woman in travail for you until Christ is formed in you. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, in Jeremiah 7, verses 8 to 11, these are very telling words about being a doer and about changing what we really are, about not just having certain impressions on the outside. Behold, Jeremiah 7, verse 8, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. All the way to verse 11. Will you steal? Will you murder? Will you commit adultery? Will you swear falsely? Will you uh, burn incense to Baal and walk after other gods whom you don't know? And then come and stand before me in my house, called by my name. Will you come to the worldwide church of God and say we're delivered to do all these abominations? Oh, God will forgive me. Are you not really changing? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. He says, don't, don't keep on doing these things, being these things and coming to church and thinking all is okay, you've got to change what you are. You've got to really convert. You've got to have my nature come into your nature. You've got to, like the rooster and the cat analogy, you've got to change to something you've never been before. You've got to become something that you can't do by yourself. That's why you need God's Holy Spirit. So that change has to be total. We become a child of God. And you know, when you see somebody who's a child of somebody, they look... They walk, they talk, they sound like, they are like their father. We had a man in one church area who had a limp because he had a club foot. He had a son who was perfectly normal. And his son, who was five or six at the time, walked with a limp because that's the way dad walked. Until finally dad had to say, son, your feet are okay. You don't need to walk with a limp. But children look like their father. Are you and I looking like father? Are you and I talking like father? Are you and I walking like father? Are we really like father? Which father? Which father? There are two fathers out there. Jesus said to the Jews, you're of your father, the devil. Which father are we looking like and acting like? Which father are we really like? And with Jesus in us, we can have God as our father. We can be made brand new. We can become something we have never been before. I enjoyed being here very much. Thank you for putting up with my laryngitis. This is now January 15, 2005. A good follow-up to this sermon. Our full-fledged, full-length sermons that go in big detail on the new creation. Also have one about now that you've repented, what does God think of you? And I think you'd find that one very encouraging. Also have in-depth one on forgiving in the same manner that Jesus forgives. Um, some of the topics or some of the points are mentioned in the sermon you just heard with far more detail, far more depth in the newer sermon. But I hope, uh, I hope this sermon was helpful to you, and God bless you all. Uh, let's forgive one another when we do repent, and allow ourselves to be new, and uh, be together in God's kingdom. God bless you all. Bye-bye.